Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to welcome sports agent Kevin Tarka of Creation Talent Agency to the podcast. Kevin and I have known each other for years, and he has a popular podcast, and you'll see that in the show notes down below. And in this conversation, we talk about his experience being a D1 walk-on and everything that comes with that. We talk about playing overseas, um, the misconceptions about that, how to become a sports agent, how to choose a sports agent, and much, much, much more. So without further ado, let's welcome Kevin Tarka to the Prep Athletics Podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Kevin, welcome to the podcast. What's happening, Corey? How you doing, man? I appreciate you having me on. Oh, it's good to have you here. And um, you played D1 basketball at Quinnipiac, and you were a walk-on there. And everyone I talked to, well, I should say a majority of everybody I talked to uh, in the high school ranks want to play D1. And some option for a lot of these kids is to walk on, but it's a completely different experience than actually being a scholarship level player. Can you kind of walk us through what your experience was like on one, why you chose to go to Quinnipiac as a walk on and two, what was the walk on experience like for you? Sure, man, that's a, that's a loaded question, but definitely <laughs> one that, uh, that I love to talk about. So, uh, I mean, I think, you know, being a walk on can, can be a byproduct of many different paths. Like for me, it was just the, the, the fact that I, wanted to play collegiate basketball. Um, I wasn't a, a division one recruit per se. And uh, I just happened to combine many reasons why I wanted to go to Quinnipiac University. For me personally, you know, I, I refer to it as like my, my own kind of algorithm. It was like, you know, what's important to me, obviously playing basketball was important, but also location and, and education and, you know, the type of school, the, the, the community that was around it is my family close enough. Are they far enough? Things like that for me. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, you know, I, I grew up in, in Montgomery, New Jersey and went to a public high school for four years and I wasn't anything, you know, too crazy in terms of, uh, on the basketball court. Uh, but yeah, I played varsity for three years and, and, and did pretty well and just knew I wanted to play at the next level. So for me, when I visited, you know, I visited a handful of division three schools, um, the ones that I wanted to potentially play at and get, uh, get a degree from, I did not get into. Um, and the ones that I visited weren't necessarily the right fits in terms of that algorithm I was speaking about. Uh, so once I visited Hampton, Connecticut and checked out the, uh, the beautiful multi-million dollar new arena, uh, met some of the, uh, the coaches and, and, you know, knew that there was potentially an opportunity to try out. I was done. I mean, I was done before I left the arena. I, you know, I, I, I basically signed, signed uh, on my imaginary letter of intent right there. Um, and uh, yeah, th that was kind of the, the story on leading up to why I chose Quinnipiac. Real quick. What, what was your connection? How'd you even get connected with that staff? Um, man, honestly, it was just, uh, I, I, I didn't get connected with them. I know I had reached out to, uh, to Tom Moore at the time. I think he, at the time when I was, uh, when I was a senior in high school, I had reached out to a couple of people on staff via email. They had responded, um, which not a lot of schools do. Uh, mm -hmm. but Tom Moore, um, who's an amazing guy, is uh, he, he responded. I think it was briefly something along the lines of, you know, come say hello or, you know, knock on the door when you're in town or something like that, which was, which obviously I took advantage of. And, and when I went to the arena, I just, you know, literally knocked on doors. I, I walked up and introduced myself and, um, you know, kind of asked about the, pr the, the, the process of walking onto the team and, and it, uh, it kind of, uh, went from there. Gotcha. What was the best part of being a walk-on? Ooh, the best part, I mean, you know, playing division one basketball in itself is, is something that not many people get to do. Um, and so just that, that experience for me was, was fantastic. I mean, I could, I could probably list hundreds of things, but, you know, getting better at basketball for sure. I mean, like I, you know, I, I had, uh, I didn't really play on any high level circuit AAU team. And so for me to be in practice um, going against uh, division one players every single day for four years was, was something that, uh, you know, I wasn't necessarily used to. Right. And so I got tremendously better. And then just the, you know, all the other stuff, it's just like, you know, real life lessons that seem kind of corny, but like they're, they're, they're true. It's like when you're part of a team, when you, 
when you don't care about uh, the label that you have or how many points you score, you just want, you know, to play your role for the team to win and um, being willing to, you know, come in early and leave late and sacrifice and not get your name in the headlines, like all those stuff that seemed kind of corny, like that was like real life stuff. Uh, and so for me, that was, that was amazing. I mean, that, you know, the trips, the travel, the camaraderie, the the ups, the downs with, uh, you know, with my brothers at Quinnipiac was, uh, yeah, it was, it was something special, man. It was, uh, it was really cool. What about the worst part of being a walk on? Ooh, the worst part. I mean, if you're a competitor at any level at first for me, the worst part was knowing that I wasn't going to play. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously that's a role that I, that I kind of formed into and that I embrace, but you know, coming from, let's say in quotes, the guy from high school, right. Starting, starting varsity point guard for three years since my sophomore year and being the man and having the ball in my hand and having my name in the newspaper the next morning. And, um, going from that to being on the sideline and barely getting into any reps in practice and, you know, literally handing out the waters like that, that was, that wasn't, that wasn't fun. Um, but, you know, again, I think it kind of served its purpose and I embraced that role and then that kind of turned into something greater, but yeah, definitely not something that, that, that people dream about. Right. Would you do it again? A hundred times over. Okay. What advice would you give someone in high school now that, that wants to walk on? What would you say to them? <clears throat> um, I, I mean, I, I think you start with asking yourself, you know, like wh- why, right? Like mm-hmm. what, what is, I mean, are you, it goes back to that algorithm, right? Like everybody has their own reason. So are you trying to go walk onto a team because you want to have that as a label? Like you want to have that label of being a division one player, or are you going to go walk onto the team because, you know, it fits into that algorithm where you're like, Hey, I'm going to go to this school. I want the experience. I want the challenge. And I am risking the opportunity of not playing basketball in college by trying out for this team. If that's it, that's a little bit better fit. But, you know, I I would start by, by reaching out. You have to differentiate yourself. I mean, think about, you know, when you ask yourself why also realize how many other people are asking themselves why and how many other people are saying, Hey, I want to be a division one walk on too. So at the end of the day, I don't care how much you differentiate yourself or how good you are. Um, the day before uh, your first practice to your first tryout, if everything went perfectly, the coach's cousin's son or the president of the school or somebody else could get their call up and say, Hey, sorry, we took your spot. And that's the reality. So, you know, you, you have to do your due diligence. You have to, you have to be open-minded. You have to be ready for, for, for a challenge or ready for a risk. And, 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 you know, you can only do that by preparing and having those conversations candidly with as many coaches as possible. And that might mean going to schools and knocking on the door. That probably will mean going to schools and knocking on the door. Yeah. And that's, that's so good. You said, what's your why? I mean, that's what I ask kids that are looking at the prep school process, right? Like, why do you want to, why do you want to leave your high school or why do you want to do an extra year? or Why do you want to play D one? Like, there are some D one programs out there, Kevin, that are not that great, right? That you see on ESPN plus there's no one in the gym. They've, they've had no tradition, no history, not great academics. Like that's D one. Like, and I always say, is that going to fill the hole in your heart where something's missing, you know, playing in a program like that. So they're not all created equal. And I was a D one or bus kid myself. I've said it many times. So I know what that feeling's like. And you know, it's, is the hole in my heart filled, uh, from being a D one program? No, but uh, you know, everyone's got to make that out. So I think it's key. You saying, "What's your why?" I think it's definitely, key. and 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 I'll double click on that real quick. And and you know, again, not to um, not to discourage dreams of of potential walk ons here in this in this character we're talking about that want to make the NBA. Oh, shoot, if you're playing college basketball and you you want to be the best player you can, of course you should shoot for the NBA. But at the same time, I don't have to crunch the numbers about how the percentage of players that go from high school to college to pro, right? So you have to think about long-term mm-hmm. and you have to think about, okay, well, yeah, part of that why should be, you know, what what am I going to do after college? Even if that means trying to play pro, like how how is this school and being a walk-on here going to help me versus potentially going to play division two or division three or NAIA or being a walk-on at another division one school, like all those elements of, alumni the coaching staff how many years they've been there what pros have gone through there what walk-ons get jobs in the financial industry if that's what you're interested in like all those things should go into that into that uh, conversation with yourself absolutely yeah you gotta look at everything on top of the basketball 
Let's jump uh, to a different topic now and uh, let's talk about being a sports agent. Why did you want to become a sports agent? Uh, for me, it was very simple. Uh, my senior year at Quinnipiac University, I I, uh, I got a degree in finance and economics. And, and, and in hindsight, I always say it makes me sound smarter than I am. But I knew that after doing some of the some of the internships of of you know accounting and finance and 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 the the sales and trading esque, I'm like that's not for me. I watched the movie Jerry Maguire one time, and I'll always go back to it. I, it just sounded cool to me. I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. Like that's that that looks cool. More so, I, you know, I, I dove into it a bit more and I knew that, hey, OK, I'm a basketball player. I have relationships. I can speak to people. I can work hard. Yeah. But like it looks cool. Like I want to go to games. I want to I want to get the, the, the perks and the benefits. And I, I had absolutely no idea what being an agent was, um, but I kind of made that decision. And, and that's how I went down that path. Yeah. And you did a unique, uh, <laughs> excuse me, route in becoming one. Excuse me. You traveled the globe for a long time making in-person contacts. Um, why did you decide to do that? Well, uh, that seed was planted early. And even before I got into the actual agent side, um, there was a, I had an opportunity to work at a sports marketing firm first, right out of school. So for me, it was kind of, okay, well, you know, uh, the analogy of, uh, you know, I, I know where I want to be. It's kind of out there somewhere, but I also realized that I might have to take a step uh, in a different direction in order to get to that further step. Right. And that sports marketing firm allowed me to stay involved with the game. We produced and managed college basketball events. And really I was building relationships with uh, college coaches and, and athletic directors. And so for me, that was pretty simple. It was like, okay, well, this can be a stepping stone to becoming that agent. So after that, after a couple of years there, I went to a small agency in Los Angeles, got my feet wet. But then after a year of that, I had the opportunity to go to Europe. And that's really when the world traveling started. And I knew that the key um, in any industry and, and to be successful in anything really is, is you know, the the people that you surround yourself with and, and the network that you have. And, 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 you know, networking is definitely a buzzword these days, but it's, it's, uh, it's usually, it's, it's not, it's not who you know. And some people will say it's who knows you, but I take it a step further and say, okay, well, it's, it's who knows you, but also who's going to answer the phone when you call them, right? I don't care if you have somebody's phone number or if someone's in your network, right? But who do you have a genuine relationship with? And for me, especially knowing that overseas or or, or, or any place outside the United States was going to be part of my business model, I needed to meet someone for for a coffee, face-to-face, say hello, knock, literally knock on doors again. Um, and uh, and then, yeah, my, my, my passionate interest for new cultures and just places outside the States, um, that, that was the beginning of that travel bug. And yeah, that just started to build the network. Now, you and I met each other on the internet first in a Zoom call, then we met in person. And once we met in person, that solidified our relationship. Tell me what you think the benefit is of actually going overseas and meeting someone in person face-to-face versus just making a Zoom connection with them. Man, well, several things. I mean, I think, first of all, you, you know, I talk about differentiating yourself a lot. And Think about how many people, how easy it is to send a text message, make a phone call, or or be on a a, a video call. Right? It actually takes a little bit of effort, to, and 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 interest to want to meet somebody face to face. And there's never you're never going to um, build a stronger relationship with somebody over the phone than you can in person. Even if that's you know literally connecting eyes, shaking a hand, that's it. Um, that's in general. Now, for me, I, I, you know, flying across an ocean and, uh, and knocking on a door, literally like, you know, that, that says something. So if you're, if you want to go be a walk on somewhere and you live in uh, New York and you want to potentially go to a school in California and you get yourself and invest in yourself and go on a flight and show up and knock on the coach's door saying, Hey, I, you know, I literally just wanted to say hello in person. That means something, right? Mm-hmm. You, you take you take initiative, and so uh, for me, that that definitely stood out, and especially when you're doing business um, globally, internationally, you know, for somebody to actually meet you to build that build that camaraderie, that trust, uh, it goes a long way. Yeah, and now, and all your travels in Europe and, and other parts of the, of the globe, like, what are some of your favorite places? Oh Just man, as a this tourist. is a whole. 
this this is a whole other episode, man. But uh, yeah, you got to you got to you got to give me the abridged version here. So, so yeah, the abridged version usually I'll go I'll, I'll go top five. The easy easy two are Spain and Italy. I, you know, my 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 family's from from Italy. My great grandparents were born there, so Italy's easy. Spain is amazing. The food, the people, the language. Um, outside of those two, I usually say uh, Belgrade, Serbia is one mm. of my favorite cities in the world. Um, Istanbul, Turkey, and uh, and then anywhere in Israel was 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 amazing so those are my those are my top five yeah you must get that question all the time so i, I do I, I have that on i have that on point i can't give one maybe, maybe a tuesday or a saturday response is going to be different but top five is is so far now which country when, when you went to for the first time just was was it the most challenging whether it was transportation money just getting around maybe you got sick oh man good good question i would say i mean you know, if if you if you have any sense of kind of adventure and you're not like frustrated if like you miss a bus or miss a plane or something like, it, contrary to popular belief, there's a lot of places in this world that are you know like relatively easy to get around. But yes, there are language barriers. I, I mean, I would say Armenia was a place that I went for the first time that was like major language barrier, not much going on, not huge basketball market, and so it was kind of like pure tourism. Um, so that was a little bit difficult, but, um, yeah, that, that's, that's the one that sticks out. I would say <laughs> Okay, the homeland of system of a down. That's, that's my <laughs> I, main... didn't know, I, I didn't know that. Okay. Oh yeah. They're, they're big time Armenians. Um, I couldn't name you another Armenian, but except that band, <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. College players, a lot of them want to play pro or play overseas and good ones have a chance upon graduation to pick an agent to help them represent them. And if they're getting a lot of looks at agents, what would your advice be to, you know, what to look for if you're if you're looking for an agent? Um, so so I'll kind of I'll answer this in two in two different versions. One is if you are being approached by agents, and then the other one is going to be, which is the majority, if you're not being approached by agents. Um, I mean, the same way it's really analogous to trying to play basketball in college right if you're being approached or recruited by division one division two division three or if you're not being recruited it's very it's very similar yeah um and so if you are being approached by agents um i i think i go back to what i said before it's 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 you know it's it's that same college selection process very very similar you go back to your why okay well what, what why do you want to be a pro what do you want to do what are your interests what are your hobbies do they all align with your algorithm right if you want to um you know be a part of a of a of a an agency, uh, for example, like Octagon that represents the Steph Curry's of the world, and you want to say, "Hey, I want to be a part of that because I want to be in the same agency as Steph Curry," uh, you know, for the label, that's not right. That's not wrong. That's fine. You have to understand what comes with that. Or if you are the type of person that says, "Hey, I want to talk to my agent every single day, be best friends with my agent," um, you know, like hear from them after my games, what I did right and what I did wrong then maybe you go with a, a, a smaller agency because they can give you more time a day. Um, you know, that's not even to mention asking what type of business model that agent has. If you are a projected draft pick, it, it, that's a very different conversation than if you're going to go play overseas and you need somebody to really hustle for you. Or, you know, if you potentially have dual citizenship and you want to make sure that you're uh, signing with an agency that has placed players in that certain country before and knows the language and, you know, th there's there's a lot of different things you can look for, but I, I think it really comes down to just lining up your your interests, passions, and vision with not only you know th there's three ways where you see yourself, uh, where the agent and agency sees yourself, but then also there needs to be where reality sees yourself, right? So, just for example, if you think that you are a uh, a, a draft pick and the agent comes and tells you you're a draft pick and you're not on a single draft board there's something wrong there, right? You guys are setting yourself up for failure, but if all three of those things align, then, you know, that could potentially be a good fit. Yeah. And we talked about, I think about a year ago, uh, a friend of mine that was starting a, uh, a company where it's kind of like prep athletics, <laughs> excuse me. If you are graduating college and you're, you know, you put in your parameters of what kind of agency they want and they'll narrow down all the agencies down there to these, couple ones that that fit your parameters right because you got boutique you got big ones and, and if you go to a big one like an octagon um 
you're not going to get the principles of the company. You're going to get a junior agent dealing with you on a daily basis, right? For sure. I mean, look, it, it's hard to generalize because everything is different. You know, the, the octagons of the world, the, the the excels of the world, the, the the Wassermans. I mean, I have friends that work at each of those and they're great people. And, you know, um, it's just different, right? It's so like, it goes back to where you're projected. If you're, if you're a top 10 uh, draft pick, like, yeah, you're probably going to get, have a meeting with the president of the company and the top agent, right? But if you're not, then you have to understand where you fall on that totem pole. Cause that's just life, right? It's like, you know, you're, I mean, go, sports are all analogous to the real world, right? It's like, you know, go to your situation on your high school team right now. Yeah. Are you the best player? Are you, are, you know, is a coach making sure that they coach you certain, a certain way versus if you're the last player on the bench, which is again, not right or wrong. I was that guy in college, but your, your, your role is different and you are, you, you have different conversations with the head coach when you're in that certain role. Same thing as a player. So if you are, you know, if you don't forget, this is all a business, even college sports now, right? As it has been. But if you are on a million dollar contract, you know, that agency, if you're talking about overseas, just to give an example, making 10%, maybe they make $100,000 revenue in commission from that contract. They're probably going to pay attention to you. If you're going to the third division of of, of Germany or the, third, or the second division of Spain and you're making $2,000 a month, Right. And they make, you know, you have a twenty thousand dollar contract and they make two thousand dollars. Where does that line up versus a hundred thousand? How much time are they going to spend on you for that ROI? So right. you, you know, it, it there's you can go more in depth than that, but you have to relate everything back to like, okay, well, why why do I deserve to be um, you know, to 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 have people uh uh cater to me every single second if I'm not bringing in revenue? Right. Give me your pitch, Kevin. Why should uh, someone sign with you to be their agent? Yeah, this this has definitely changed over the years. I mean, I think starting out when I didn't get the opportunity to work for those those big agencies that you mentioned, or really any agency, um, you know, that there, there's a there's a good story behind that of just knocking on doors and writing letters to every agency in, in the in the country, and I just didn't get an opportunity. And so when I went out independently on my own. You know, I had to, I just had to hustle like I really did because it's hard to go into a meeting and say, hey, here's my book of business and my results. Um, based on this, you should sign with me. You know, the first several years is is like, hey, look, I can tell you what I know. I can tell you what I don't know. I can be genuine. You can see my network and my 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 experience and where I've been. And I can't promise you much more than that besides just promising you that I'm going to hustle for you. Right. And that attracts a certain type of player, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I, I really think for, for me and, and a lot of people say this, but you know, you can, you can have your own gut feeling about it is are, are they keeping it real with me? Like you, you don't want someone that's going to tell you what you want to hear. You want someone that's going to tell you what you need to hear. And that's what I try to do. I, I really try to do that. And so if that's, if, if that's someone out there that, you know, not only, um, you know, do you have aspirations beyond the court? But, um, you know, don't forget, you, you could potentially generate some revenue for for my company, all these things come into it. And yeah, maybe you're a good fit for that. Um, yeah, that's it. I mean, that was kind of the overarching spiel. I can, I can dive into that further if you'd like. No, that's perfect. That is perfect. Well, tell me this, what's one big misconception that people have about sports agents? Uh, well, a big misconception is definitely like, um, the misconception, misconception that I had when I wanted to be a sports agent you watch a movie or you see something on Instagram and you think sports agents make a ton of money and sit courtside and get mm -hmm. new cars and, and get flown all over the country. And, um, unfortunately that's not the case for the majority, um, of agents. And, and I also think, um, I also think it, there's a misconception on what agents do. That's definitely changing in the landscape of of the industry now, but um, you know, it, it's more than just uh, having a relationship with the player, then picking up the phone and and negotiating contract. It's it's understanding the markets. It's really um, you know identifying where a certain type of uh, a certain type of player can play and where they can fit and where going to one country to another league to another league is going to get them to their goal versus going the opposite direction and. Uh, there's there's a lot involved with it. A lot of its relationships, a lot of its um, you know experience, but it really is knowing the market as well. Yeah, perfect. Uh, help me on this one. Here's a term that's thrown around a lot, which I'm sure you'll laugh at. But um, you know, obviously, there's only so many spots in the NBA, and you hear from coaches and trainers and players 
the quote, oh, they'll just play overseas. Like it's just a given to players that aren't going to go in the NBA. And you're shaking your head right now. What, how hard is it to play internationally or how easy is it to play internationally? Like, tell me, tell me when I say that statement, what comes to your mind? It's, uh, I mean, it's just, it's one of the misconceptions. Um, I, I do, I do hear that a lot. And I think, unfortunately, it, it's because of one of the reasons I started my podcast is just like because of the lack of education and the lack of, of, of information out there. That's, that's, I mean, I don't know whose fault that is. I don't know if that's, you know, uh, uh, USA basketball's fault or the governing body or FIBA or whatever, but there's not information out there. So players will see something on Instagram or on sports center or on social media and you see the highlight like anything else in life. And you think, okay, well, yeah, I'm a division one basketball player and I'm really good. And maybe I'm not on draft boards and it's okay if the, the, the bulls don't draft me, but I will go to Barcelona or I will go to Milan or I will go to Paris and make hundred K. And, and my friend, for those of you listening, who have never heard this um, topic of conversation, you are very mistaken and you need to understand what, what, you know, playing abroad means. And that usually means that you are going to go to a city that you've never heard of. um, And you are going to potentially make a couple hundred bucks or a thousand bucks a month. If you're lucky, if you get paid on time, you're going to arrive in the city. No one's going to speak your language. You're going to get maybe into an Uber or into somebody picking you up that, you know, drops you off at uh, most likely a hotel first because your apartment's not going to be ready. Then when you get to practice, the lights don't work in the gym and it's freezing cold and you don't have Wi-Fi. And I can go on and on about this because you can you, you could probably tell I've, I've done this speech before. It's like mm-hmm. it's very different. It's um, and it depends on, you know, when we say abroad or overseas, that really depends on where you're playing. If you're playing in the second division of Japan or if you're playing in the Philippines or if you're playing in, um, you know, in the Ukraine or if you're playing in Barcelona. It really, really depends. And it's, uh, it's um, you know, th- there's there's many different situations out there. But what I can tell you is that, uh, you know, y- you basically start over the same way that you start over from being the best player in high school to going up, up a notch to playing in college. You're with the best of the best. So same thing when you're going from college, it doesn't matter what you score. You know, when you're a freshman in college, it doesn't matter that you scored 75 points in your game in high school or you're the conference player of the year. When you're a pro, no one cares. You think that you, you think that the first day of practice, um, you know, if for the Boston Celtics and there's a couple of rookies there, you think that, you know, the vets are saying, yeah, man, this guy scored 25 points a game in college. They don't care. They don't care. So you got to re-earn everything. And that starts with your salary and your position on the totem pole. You know, it's interesting as a middle-aged man. Now I, I would have, I would have gone to overseas for 200 bucks a week just for the experience of, of experience another culture and I know that's the minority because kids are just wanting that payday. They're wanting to get to the G League, to the NBA. And I wonder how many kids miss out at the early in their early 20s on the beautiful culture that's around them, just not being present, just looking ahead. And I, everyone's different. I'm just I'm just projecting how amazing I think it would be because you know my father played out of college in Switzerland for a year, and he and my mom went over there. They had to get jobs. Right. Because Mm -hmm. they didn't get paid enough. They did not get paid on time. They got a car and apartment and free meals at this one restaurant in town. And the coaches didn't speak English. So my dad, that was, that was 1972. Right. And it still sounds like that still happens today. Now (laughs) he took advantage of it. And from that one trip, a little farm boy from Indiana has now traveled the world because of playing pro overseas. He loved what it kind of offered, but, um, you just wonder how many kids are just not taking advantage of the culture. Do you experience that too in your conversations? Without a doubt. I, and I'll say this, I, I can, I can argue for both sides of it. I can say first, first of all, um, if you love the game, okay. I mean, if you can even argue if you don't love the game and you have an opportunity to go overseas or, you know, play abroad somewhere um, from a life experience, you may never get that opportunity again. So somebody to pay for your flight to go to a place you've never been to go outside your comfort zone and try some new food and meet some new people and put a little basketball in a hoop some days. And maybe you're good at it. Maybe you're not that, that is, that is priceless. Um, and I highly recommend it. Uh, but on the other hand, I will say if you're in it for the bag, if you're in it to make money, uh, we can have a whole separate conversation on how I can act how I can actually help you get a, get, get a job in corporate America or, or, or an international uh, global company, because 
of the skill set that you have and how successful you will be. And, you know, if you're in it to say, Hey, I don't, and look, there's nothing wrong with this. Um, I was blessed enough to where, uh, you know, I wasn't in a situation where I came out of school saying, I never want my mother to work a day again in her life. Like I, you know, I, I'm, I'm super lucky that I'm not in that situation, but a lot of conversations, whether it's that, or, you know, you have a kid or you have bills to pay people will say, Hey, like I, I, I need to go make money because I never, you know, I want to buy my mom a house and that's amazing and you can get there. But if that's your reason, mm -hmm. let's talk because I can go get you a $75,000 uh, starting salary at a, you know, at a, at a, at a technology sales company. And, and you might not, maybe you not don't start at 70, but you make six figures in a year or two because of your skill set and your work ethic and learn and your coachability. If you, if you're in it for the bag and you don't love the game, go that path because it's going to be great. It will be great. But again, back, back to square one, if you have the opportunity, like, you know, th those jobs will always be there. So go experience yeah. it, go experience life right now. Yeah. I, I agree with that. But once again, I've lived a lot more life and I don't know if I'd have had that same attitude at 22 either. So for I sure, get. for sure. For um, sure. But I, I think, you know, I would like to think that the way that I said it, I, I, I think I've gotten good at it. Like if, if somebody was there telling me that at that time, I would hope that it would have resonated, but you're right. It's it's very difficult to 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 have that mindset when you were 20, 21, 22. I I for sure agree. A couple of notes on that. Friend of the podcast, Paul Shirley. I don't know if you've read his book or not. Can I keep my jersey? I, I don't think I have, but I'm writing it down now, adding it to my book list. So he played at Iowa State, big man, and uh he might have gotten drafted, but he 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 wrote a book that's so well written about all the stuff you just mentioned, not getting paid. Um, not speaking a language, coaching issues, visa issues. But he did end up getting to the NBA and playing like a minute with the Suns, a minute with the Bulls. Um, he's got great stories about, you know, he was on that team when uh, Marty Stoudemire and Steve Nash and the Suns were just, you know, steamrolling through the West. And uh, so he's, it's a great book to read on playing in the NBA and overseas and kind of, you know, coming from a guy that just tried to absorb it all. And then <laughs> there was a podcast, I think it was an NPR that uh, followed a kid, Quinn Cook, out of Duke, who was in the G League, trying to get to the NBA. And then there was a big guy who'd been overseas for probably 10 years, making half a million a year in one of these bigger clubs that, you know, like a Milan or a Barcelona. But it always nagged him. He'd never made it to the NBA, right? He could not see that half a million dollars in a foreign country was a good thing because it was not that, that big contract in the NBA. And he was always injury prone. So he took a chance and went to the G League Right, so he could be close to NBA executives, just for that chance playing the NBA. So he gave up five hundred thousand dollars to make whatever they make in the G League, and his injuries came back, and bam, career was over. No more half million. His dream wasn't realized. And it's a chance he took on himself, but you know it, that NBA is so powerful. And you know, I don't know if you know this stat or not, Kevin, but less than five thousand players have ever played one minute in the NBA. It's easier to get struck by lightning than to play in the NBA, right? So just a mm -hmm. couple little anecdotes there about, you know, the international game and trying to make it to the league. I, I love it, man. It, it goes back to crunching numbers. Like, you know, it, it, I, I don't think people are aware how difficult it is. And and that's an interesting story. I, I, I'm not, I have to I have to go back and see. I'm curious as to who the big guy is. But yeah, it happens all the time. I mean, um, you know, you, you, you're going to have an opportunity where, you know, again, I don't, if your dream is to make the NBA, I love it. Absolutely love it. You know, and if you say, Hey, you know, there's an economic upside um, and I'm willing to risk X, Y, and Z to get there. That is amazing. Right. You're, you're differentiating yourself. You're willing to put everything on the table. You're willing to say, Hey, I'll sacrifice 500,000 because, you know, this team's promising me a spot on the team, not a contract, but maybe I'll go take a $35,000 a year G league salary because if I get two call-ups, then I'll make, you know, $768,000, right? Total or whatever, whatever it is. It's like, cool. I love that. But it's the risk reward that every single person has to understand. And they have, and that's your own algorithm, right? Um, but yeah, that's, that, there's stories like that all the time. Yeah. That podcast, it's NPR. Look up NPR with Quinn Cook. I don't know what NPR show it was, but cool. um, that will tell you. And that one was fascinating because it is, it's like, you're gambling on yourself. And that's why I tell kids too. And just in my little world about doing a post-grad year, you might spend a lot of money on this year, hoping to get a scholarship. It, it might not work out that way. So that's a gamble you're taking. You are betting on yourself 
to try to get to that next level, which is ideally a scholarship. So it's there's no right way to do it. In fact, if we could come up with a prescription, we'd be billionaires because we'd say, hey, it's a billion dollars. Just follow these 12 steps. You'll make it to the league. But I, I've been trying to crack that code, Kevin. Like, what is the common denominator that all these NBA guys have? And my theory is, right, it's a little bit of trauma. There is some trauma or some slight in their childhood that that I don't think you're born with it, but it was some seed planted by some comment or some thing that made these players have that drive to where they had to be the best no matter what anybody else said. And you have people that come from no money at all. You've got people like Steph Curry and Kobe Bryant that did come from money, so it's not it's not the trainers and the stuff you grew up with. It's something in there. And, you know, I had a guidance counselor tell me I'd never make it the Air Force Academy. And it was a, it was a throwaway comment that I never forgot. And it was, took her two seconds to say that. And I would hear that in my brain for the five years I was at the Academy if times got tough. So that's my theory is trauma. What do you see potentially as kind of a common denominator among NBA players? Absolutely. I mean, that's that's a great one. I mean, I think, you know, like whether it's whether it's classified as trauma or, um, you know, really going back to like overcoming some type of adversity. Right. And, and so like you could say, I mean, two things come to mind. One is, um, is failing. Right. So I would, I would bet this would be an interesting case study. I would bet if you, if you, if you did a study on every single of those, one of those 5,000 NBA players that played more than a minute, um, there are stories upon stories upon stories of failures, whether that means getting cut from his middle school team, like the infamous Michael Jordan story, um, or whether that means, um, you know, you, you, I don't know, they got, they did something stupid in college and they lost their scholarship, whether it was, you know, their fault or someone else's fault. And, and, and then they, they, they failed, like, you know, they missed that game winning shot and they think about that championship game every single day. I bet you failure is a big one. Um, and then there's no question about it, like anything else in, in life. Uh, you can also go to every single one of those 5,000 players. And I bet you they can pinpoint an exact time that they got lucky. Yeah. And you can call it, you can call it lucky. You can call it timing. Right. So there's not what I don't, there, there, there's not one thing. There's a handful of things in those players algorithms that a certain level of trauma, a certain level of failing, a certain level of luck, a certain level of preparedness, a certain level of, uh, of, 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 um, you know, not giving up this and, 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 and those combined is a, is a recipe for, you know, for, for being the best in the world. Well, we talk about getting struck by lightning. You have to have lightning in a bottle of all those things, everything lining up perfectly, perfectly. And there is so much yep. luck in that. Right. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Cause if I could figure out that, uh, you know, how do you instill a little bit of trauma or a slight into a kid? And also make sure they're athletic enough and have the work ethic and are smart enough and play in the right teams. But like, it just, it's impossible. Right. And my, I have family members that played in the NBA, right. My cousin who I grew up with, he did it for 14 years. And like, I was there with him going to camps growing up. I didn't see it. I don't know how the heck he did it, but he comes from a divorced family. Like maybe it was, and I haven't talked to him about this, yeah. but maybe it was him trying to show his dad, like, well, oh, you want to leave our family? I'll show you. And maybe that's what it was. You know, I, Somewhat, it's got to be something. Yeah, but, yeah. Anyway, because you and I, I have, you know, the events we've been to together, we've seen we've seen major talent. And a fun thing that a uh, friend of the podcast, Blair O'Donovan, who is the head strength coach of the Wizards, would say was after March Madness, he'd have guys that were heroes of March Madness come in the Washington Wizards practice facility doing you know pre draft workouts, and he's like, yeah, these are guys were first team All Americans. You know, their names will forever live on in March Madness lore, and they just didn't have it. They just didn't have it where there's guys in the Wizards and other teams from programs you've never heard of before, guys you've never heard of that are professionals because they can do the job that needs to be done. You don't have to worry about them, you know, getting in trouble. And it just put in the perspective, like, you know, it doesn't matter where you go. You can make it to the NBA, but you got to be a professional on top of having the amazing skill set, the work ethic, IQ, et cetera, et cetera. No doubt. I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone will ever, uh, find the perfect uh, <laughs> blueprint. Um, but those variables that we mentioned are, are without a question, all part of it. Here's another fun fact. One out of seven, one out of five, seven footers that play NCAA basketball, make it to the NBA. That is a, that is a great fact. I like that. Yeah. So even if you're wow. that big, you know, it doesn't, 
Uh, let me ask you this. You did one podcast a day for 365 days. How did that help your business? And what, what did you learn during that year of doing podcasts? Man, that was uh, that was quite the year for sure. Um, I, uh, I I tell a story. The reason that I did that is I had a buddy Sean Light um, who was doing that same exact thing, and 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 you know it came from Russell Brunson, who's this you know this digital marketing guru has this you know this this big agency, and and he said in one of his books and one of his his uh, you know speaking events, he said, look, if you if you put out content whether that's a blog or a podcast or, or, or a journal or Facebook live or whatever, every single day for one year straight, you're never going to have to worry about money again. And we were both like, Whoa, that's really interesting. And um, I, I usually follow that up now after that year with, I still very much have to worry about money, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was uh, it was an exercise that was, that was great because, you know, it, um, on about day, I don't know, 17, 18, I was like, shit, this is going to be tough. I'm like, I don't have anything else to say. Uh, but it forced me out of my comfort zone. It forced me to get comfortable with myself speaking. It forced me to, you know, really pull the audience and really see what the problems that needed to be solved and the information that people needed to hear and wanted to hear. And um, it helped with networking and reputation and becoming an expert in the industry or at least seen as an expert in the industry. Um, and uh, and in terms of business, I mean, it it... Uh, it actually, it actually, I signed a client because the first time we met, he reached out because he listened to a podcast episode. So that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I mean, I would say, you know, outside of being disappointed that um, I'm not a multi-billionaire, I don't have to worry about money again. Um, it was definitely, uh, you know, something that, that just proves that resilience and, um, and, you know, discipline really do build up exponentially. And, you know, by episode 250, it was like, whoa, this is being viewed in 50 countries. And then by, you know, 300, it was like, wow, there's like, you know, we're approaching 35, 40,000 downloads. And then once you get to that year straight, it just, you know, that chart just keeps going up and up and up. Um, so that was great. Uh, you know, I, I obviously in, in season two here now, wrapping up season two, um, I did not do an, an episode every single day because it definitely takes planning and it definitely takes mm -hmm. a lot out of you. But uh, it, it was what kickstarted the entire podcast. And, you know, I think it's uh, definitely a reason that uh, that it has the following and the, you know, I'm able to get the amazing guests on uh, like yourself that I've had on. Yeah, no, it's good being on there. And I just I just like, wow, you, you can't have kids in a family uh, if, you, <laughs> if you're doing. Something yeah, that, like that. <laughs> that would have been tough. That would have been tough. Um, so I'm dealing with high schoolers, prep school kids or families. Is there any advice you can give them if they want to? play obviously in the nba or overseas internationally is there anything they can start doing in high school to start either physically preparing them or mentally preparing them or any prescription you'd give to kind of help them get to that path eventually sure uh there, there there are a handful of things i'll say i'll say one go back to the thing that i'll try to repeat as many times as i can on, on your episode is is ask yourself why like what's your why i mean you know, you, you have to realize that even if you play for 10 years, how old are you going to be after 10 years? And that's an outlier. And what do you want to do with the rest of your life? So think about that as you start to make those decisions. Um, because at the end of the day, I want all my clients and I want whoever's listening to want to dream for the NBA and dream for that division one scholarship. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, but I will say if you're talking basketball specific, like you, you just, if you're not being recruited again, two, two conversations. If you're, if you're being recruited, it's a little bit easier because you have those decisions to make versus trying to get yourself in a position to have a decision to make. So if you're not being recruited, go visit schools, knock on doors, uh, you know, tap into your network, ask for favors, ask for at least a favor to an introduction to a coach, ask coaches what you have to do, what their tryout stuff is like, start analyzing rosters, how many, how many walk on tryouts, uh, you know, are in this conference or that conference. And what's the school that I'd be willing to go to if I didn't play basketball and what's the risk reward scenario in terms of um, the actual basketball stuff. Again, if you're not being recruited, it doesn't really matter if you think you're amazing or you're not amazing, right. It doesn't really matter, but you know, just always, always find ways to uh, you know, to get better, whether that means going to, you know, checking yourself into a, 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 a an AAU tournament that you might not be uh used to going to on the circuit and trying to get a couple minutes or trying to at least get the practice with players that are those division one scholarships to surround yourself to actually get better. Um, and in terms of the overseas thing, just remember, uh, you know, if you're going to play at the next level after college, whether it is abroad or whether it is in the States and G league, whatever, 
it's 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 just a small piece of 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 your life it could be an amazing big huge long piece great um but you know you have to have those variables that you mentioned throughout the podcast to uh to succeed so you have to be lucky you have to be skilled you have to be determined you have to be willing to go through failure um and all those things have to line up so i i know that was a handful of kind of recommendations but you know there's not a blueprint mm -hmm. so like even if you're listening to this looking for a blueprint I, I i wish i could tell you there was but there's not like i can tell you i can tell you exactly what to do but you still have to go do it and you still have to get a little bit lucky so you know th there's 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 not an easy there's not an easy answer yeah, that's that was a tough question to ask because we just discussed how it, it is lightning in a bottle sometimes. On your website, you've got uh, something called the Sports Agent Educational Journey. Can you tell us what that is? Sure. That that was a class, uh, an online course that I put together probably at this point two years ago. It was originally for, you know, I would get questions of, hey, how do, how do I become an agent? Like, how do I work with you or how do I get my license? And it was really just a place where I can create a course that somebody can go learn what, how to do that. You know, what, what you need to do to actually get your licenses, what's the different business models of agencies, what is it like playing abroad in the different leagues? Uh, how, you know, if you are an agent, how do you recruit players? What do you look for? What do you not look for? What are red flags? And so I basically just put all that information into a course. Uh, again, it was originally for aspiring agents. I've had players take that course that want to learn more about the agency world. Uh, I, I, I plan to hopefully in the future, there will be more of a player specific, like pro course on some of the topics we talked about today. Um, but it's really for anyone that wants to learn more about the agency world and just have information that's really difficult to find online, um, you know, at your disposal. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Hey, Kevin, we're at the end of the podcast here. We got a couple quick hitter questions for you. I'm Who ready. The, okay. Who is the best player you've ever guarded? Ooh, ever guarded? See, now that's or played that's against tough. in a game. I'll tell you that too. Okay. okay, so so that's tough because, as I mentioned before, I didn't get much playing time as a walk on, so I can't say I remember the best player I ever guarded. Um, but a couple come to mind. So uh, we in in the AAU uh, season, we played against Tyreek Evans. Mm. Um, I did not guard him. Um, and then two others that I did not guard, but during college when I was at Quinnipiac, we played against CJ McCollum when he was a freshman at Lehigh. We went to Lehigh and uh, he gave us the business. We did lose that game. Um, and then uh, Jeremy Lin, we scrimmaged him when uh, when he was at uh, at Harvard. So I got to see two of those, those two guys at least uh, in their college prime before they made it to, uh, to big time. Okay. What's the biggest win of your playing career? Either in high school uh, or Quinnipiac? Yeah, it, it, it. I mean, I, I wish I was sitting here telling you that, you know, it was a trip to the NCAA tournament, um, but it wasn't. And so with that being said, I will revert back to my claim to fame, which is my senior year, a buzzer beater in the state tournament at, uh, at Montgomery High School. So that, that, that that's my little, uh, when I need some confidence boost, I pull that clip up on YouTube and it gives me, uh, you know, gives me some happiness there. That's great. Not everyone can hit a buzzer beater in the playoffs. So that that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are your hobbies when you're not doing what we just talked about for an hour? Um, I mean, I love, I love to travel. It's kind of one and the same, you know, I, I kind of mix business with pleasure, right? Like when I'm traveling, I, I, I make sure that if I'm visiting a client, I'm, I'm, wherever I am, I need to learn new things. Uh, I do love to cook. Uh, that's definitely, definitely one of the hobbies. But uh, yeah, I'd say yeah, I'd say cooking and just traveling, traveling anywhere. Love, I'm with you on that one. Uh, last one here, favorite movie of all time. Cool, of all time. Um, I'm a big comedy movie guy. Like any anything with Adam Sandler. Um, maybe uh, although it wasn't a com, it wasn't a comedy, but Hustle, his recent one was amazing. Oof, um, actually, first one that actually kind of. Got got the real life of, of like an agent or a scout kind of, you know, uh, correct. But yeah, I'd say like, I don't know. Billy Madison is always a great one. It's always a great throwback or happy Gilmore. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, where can people find you, uh, on the internet? Uh, you can follow me on all social. It's just Instagram is at Kevin Tarka or at creation talent creation with a K, but yeah, I mean, I, my, my, my personal brand's really 
is where I share a lot of information, um, kind of share the places I'm traveling and, 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 you know, different highlights of my clients. So at Kevin Tarka on Instagram or same thing on Twitter, except uh, I think there's, there's an underscore between my first and last name because someone stole my, uh, my name and they haven't logged into that account in 12 years, literally. So I still haven't been able to get that yet, but yeah, that's, at that's... Kevin Tarka or, uh, you can always shoot me an email. I mean, I, you know, feel free to put that in, in, in the, uh, in the description. It's kevin.tarka at gmail.com. Feel free to send a, a message my way. Happy to connect. Is there anything we did not discuss today? You think we sh- our listeners should know about? Hmm, man, I'm sure we can. Uh, that's a tough question to ask me. I mean, I don't, I don't know how much time I got my calendar here, but we could probably go for hours. I, I think we, you know, we covered a lot of good stuff. Uh, you know, the, the biggest thing that I'm kind of transitioning to, well, not transitioning to, but, you know, really trying to prioritize is that, you know, life really is bigger than the game. And so you can use, at whatever level you're at, you can use the sport that you play. It doesn't have to be basketball. Um, but if you're an athlete, you can use that sport to open up doors for the rest of your life. I don't care if you're a high schooler or if you're in college or if you are playing abroad somewhere or if you are in the, the NBA. You know, use leverage what you have now to open up doors for when you're a non-athlete, in quotes, because there's a big difference between being a current collegiate high school or professional athlete having business conversations and speaking with someone and open up, opening up doors for future careers than when you are a former athlete. So yeah, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a topic that I'm passionate about. So happy to, uh, happy to chat about it further if anyone is interested. Well, perfect. We'll put all your contact information in the show notes, but uh, Kevin, thank you so much for joining the podcast today. Uh, you shared some great information that I think a lot of people are going to walk away with a better understanding of how this works with uh, finding an agent, playing overseas, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you for joining. Um, this was another episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. If you like it, please feel free free, free to subscribe on the YouTube channel or all the major podcasting platforms. Uh, if you ever want to reach out to me with any questions, it's coreyheights at gmail.com, or you can go to prepathletics.com to contact me there. And uh, you guys have a happy holidays. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much.